Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to the inaugural Find Yourself in the Future program, launching for the very first time across the US and Canada. This series of live broadcast tech talks connects academies and their students, as well as the general public, directly with Cisco experts focused on the newest technology trends. As part of this program in the future, we will conduct virtual career fairs connecting soon-to-be graduates of our Cisco Networking Academy courses with our ecosystem of partner companies who are looking to hire qualified individuals to join their tech force. It's an exciting time to have a career in networking. Intent-based networking can dramatically improve performance, agility, security, and reliability of the network. Combine that with the awesome artificial intelligence we hear so much about, and we see significant improvements to the network, which often appears somewhat magical. To keep you up to date with these new technologies, Cisco Networking Academy offers its new CCNA courses designed for participants who are seeking associate-level jobs in IT. The three-course series provides an integrated and comprehensive coverage of networking topics, including IP routing and switching fundamentals, network security and services, which are critical, and network programmability and automation, while also providing learners with extensive opportunities for critical hands-on practice and career skills. To kickstart your exciting career in networking, enroll today by finding an academy near you that offers CCNA courses. We have placed the QR code on the screen and the URL link in the chat window, so take a look at that. In the interest of time, we will take any questions you have today for our guest speaker directly after his session before the end of the hour. Thanks, and let's get started. I would like to welcome our guest speaker, John Apostolopoulos, Cisco's Vice President and CTO for Enterprise Networks. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Rebecca. I, I very much appreciate the invitation to share this uh, very exciting topic with you and all our colleagues joining uh, online. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence for intent-based networking. And here is the, the outline of how I'm going to use our time together. First, I want to give a little brief overview of what are some of the challenges that people face with networking and network applications. This is kind of the motivation for why we need intent-based networking. Then I'll give a conceptual overview of what we mean by intent-based networking, what I mean by intent-based networking. And then we'll talk about why do we need artificial intelligence, or AI, and what is AI? Then I'll look at four examples about how we can bring AI plus intent-based networking together to provide its significant improvements in the four areas you see right here. Intelligent automation, intelligent assurance, understanding what's on the network, and detecting threats and encrypted traffic. So with that, let's begin. And what I want to do to start is look back a little bit at what networks were once upon a time, let's say like 20 years ago, and see how things have progressed. Maybe 20 years ago or, or so, a network looked sort of like this. You had a campus and branch, you had a mainframe server that connected by a WAN, and the network perimeter was pretty clear. On the right-hand side, you see some conceptual views of what complexity was and security and the expectations the users had, as well as the rate at which people would want to make changes in the network. And, and back then, all of these numbers were pretty low. Okay, So this was relatively simple. Then in the internet era, we added the data center. We, people wanted to connect to the internet and to SaaS services on the internet. And also on the left-hand side here, you see that people started bringing laptops home and want to connect to the campus branch via the VPN. So things started to get more complicated. Now today, we have massive advances in IoT and in multi-cloud. So for instance, in the campus and branch on the left-hand side here, you see a much wider diversity of devices, uh, tablets, uh, phones, uh, wearables, various IoT devices like surveillance cameras and so forth. Also, on the right-hand side, not only do you see the data center and the internet, uh, but you see the public cloud and an ever-increasing amount of uh, SaaS services. In between the two, we have software-defined WAN to help connect them in a, in a very efficient and cost-effective manner, as well as the cloud edge. 
So there's a lot happening on the, uh, with multi-cloud on the right-hand side. And if we look back now at the left-hand side, we see some other things too. Some of these devices, they actually, even though they're on-premise in the campus or branch, they no longer uh, connect view the campus or branch. They would instead connect over cellular directly to the cloud. Okay, so as you can see, the perimeter has like completely disappeared now. Uh, and by the way, this is one of the reasons that Cisco acquired uh, Duo about two and a half years ago to help the users with those mobile devices be able to securely access uh, uh, SaaS services. Okay, so this shows some of the complexity that we have today. Here is another view, um, and in this view, what I try to do is I try to show three classes of customer challenges. And these three different classes correspond to these three columns. So each one of the columns is a class of, of challenge. The top row describes the challenge, and the, the bottom row describes how IBN and AI can help solve the challenge. So let's look at these challenges. The first one, digital acceleration. What happens here, as you know really well, is that everybody's using mobile. Everybody's using multi-cloud. More and more IoT devices are coming online. In essence, um, there's, a, there's a huge number of new devices coming online continuously. And what happens is that people who operate networks, they don't know what these devices are, and they don't know how to deal with them uh, and how to interact with them. One of the ways that intent-based networking and AI can help is it can help the network operator identify what is on the network. And based on knowing what's on the network, you can learn, you can decide how you want to treat those devices. Okay. The second big uh, challenge is complexity. Um, as you know, networks are complex. And as an example of this, some studies have shown that companies spend about $60 billion annually on network operations. So why do they spend so much on network operations? They spend so much because most of the operations are still manual. Uh, and also because these operations often, because they're done manually, it, it takes a long time to make changes and we can make mistakes. So it's also error prone. The way that IBN and AI can help here is of course automation, but we want more than automation. We want intelligent automation. We want to figure out not just how to automate one of these network operations, but we want to figure out how to automate it in a way that's, that is optimized. For example, there could be multiple paths to the internet. Which is the path that provides the lowest latency? Also, how do you automate things to support compliance and so forth? Another thing we want is we want, we want to understand what's happening in the network. And it's slowly possible to get data from across the network, but we don't want a tsunami of data because we can't actually consume or understand a tsunami of data. Instead, we want to take that data and from it, we want to analyze it and identify the useful, relevant insights and share those insights with uh, people running the network so they can understand what's happening and decide, to do, uh, and decide what to do next. A third key area is assurance. We want to know, is the network behaving the way it should? If yes, awesome, we're done. If not, why not? What's the problem and how we can fix it? We call that assurance, and I'll talk more about that later in my talk. The third set of challenges is in security. As you know, because there are more and more IoT devices getting on the network, the attack surface is dramatically increasing. Also, we have very sophisticated attackers often backed by large organizations, sometimes uh, backed by countries. And this is leading to more and more sophisticated attacks. So one of the ways intent-based networking and AI can help here is for faster detection of these threats and then faster remediation. So what I'm gonna do later in my talk is I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll give you two examples of how we address complexity, especially in, in improving automation and assurance. I'll also give you an example in the first column of identifying what's on the network. And I'll also give you an example of the third column of how we identify threats in the network, in particular, uh, malware and encrypted traffic. So we'll give examples of all, of all these classes of challenges. So now let's look at a conceptual view of uh, intent-based networking. Um, let me describe the motivation here. Um, as, as many of you know, if you are going to uh, roll out a new service, let's say a new uh, video conference service or something like that, you would probably want to go and change the QS settings throughout the network to help support it. 
And as you know, that's really complicated, uh, very detail-oriented, and can take a huge amount of time. One of our aspirational goals was the following. What if we could just state what we intend to do and have the network figure out the rest? That is, we, we state we want to ha bring on this new video conference and application, and the network figure out how to apply the QoS throughout the, throughout the network to get the job done. This is our aspirational goal. Okay? Now, this is a journey. We don't have this yet, but we've made major inroads toward this goal, and we're going to continue to work toward this. Let me describe this in a little bit more detail. Here's my conceptual uh, overview of intent-based networking. Um, uh, and there are basically five, five key parts of this diagram. At the bottom in gray is the physical and virtual infrastructure. These are the wireless APs and the switches and the routers and the servers and the storage and so forth. At the top, these are, um, we have the people uh, who are trying to do something or machines who are trying to do something. And they provide the intent. The intent that is processed by these three different operations, translation, activation, and assurance. And, and, and let me give you a concrete example of what we mean by intent and what we mean by uh, intent in the translation. So here is an example of intent. I have a telemedicine session at 10 a.m. with Monica. Okay? That's a very easy to understand intent. It's something that a human would describe. Now, the goal of translation is to take that intent and translate it to what are the network and security policies that we want to turn on in the network to enable that intent. So, for example, we want to create a, a high definition video connection between the sender and the receiver. We then want to prioritize it with end-to-end -end quality of service across all the elements in between, the, wire, the Wi-Fi wireless, the, the campus switching, the WAN, and so forth. We want to keep the communication safe with authentication and encryption. We want to validate the performance. By that, I mean during the session, during the telemedicine session, we want to track what is the performance, and if, if everything's going great, awesome. If there are any problems, though, we want to proactively identify that there's a problem, figure out the root cause, and try to solve it quickly so it doesn't affect the, uh, the session. And finally, at the end, we want to turn down the connection after the call. So this is an example of, a, of an intent, a human express intent, and how it gets translated to various network and security policies. And as you can guess, we can go into much more detail in terms of the network and security policies, but this is just a relatively simple example. So that's what the top uh, green uh, uh, box does. It does a translation from the intent to it translated to the network and security policies. Now, the activation box there in blue, what it does is it takes those network and security policies and it automates them on the network. Okay? It basically turns them on in the network. But it actually does more than just automation. It tries to optimize those automations to figure out what is the right thing to do. For instance, you wanted, first of all, to implement best practices. Um, second of all, you want to, if they're, like, like the example I gave before, if the multiple paths we can take, which is the path that will give the best performance for the application? For some applications, may want low latency. Other applications may want really high bandwidth. A third class of applications may want both. So what we want to do is choose, optimize and choose the right path for the right application. So that's also part of the activation step here. Um, by the way, the reason we call this activation instead of automation is that one of the things it does is automation, but it does much more than that. It also does this optimization I described. In addition, all three of these bo colored boxes here, activation, translation, and assurance, they're all automated. So if we called it automation, it, you know, it would be a little confusing. So that's why we chose the, the term activation. I hope that makes sense to you now. Um, now, we don't just want to activate these services on the network. We also want to check, is the network behaving the way it should? Is this uh, tele uh, telemedicine session between John and Monica, is it operating with the desired quality of experience for all the users? And that's the goal of the assurance uh, box there. What, what happens is in, in assurance is we monitor what happens in the network. The monitoring can come from the network elements, from the network devices, from the applications, so forth. And we see, is that network operating as, be, as intended? If yes, awesome. We, we show a grin and light to the operator. If no, we try to identify why not. What is the root cause? 
as well as candidate solutions for that root cause. And we share that information with the operator, who then can decide, hey, I, I see this problem. I agree that this is the right way to solve it. Let's activate it. So it's then activated in the network. Um, and then once again, we can use this feedback loop to monitor the network, see, hey, is the problem fixed? If yes, great. If not, what else do we need to do? So hopefully now you got a quick understanding of what we mean by uh, these three conceptual, uh, well, these three functions in this conceptual diagram of intent-based networking. And I'll give you some more examples of it uh, shortly. Um, many of you may want to know, may want a deeper dive in terms of traditional networking and intent-based networking. Uh, I co-wrote a white paper that's available uh, uh, that describe that gives a very detailed comparison. What you can see at the bottom here is some of the terms you can do a search on the internet to to find that white paper. So I encourage you to look at it if you want to learn more. Um, and I also want to mention that we have built now, multiple uh, uh, systems to do intent-based networking. The first one in the data center, we built Cisco ACI. In the campus and branch, we built Cisco DNA. And in SD-WAN, I'm sorry, in the WAN, we built uh, Cisco SD-WAN, software-defined WAN. So each one of these architectures was optimized to do really well in the data center, in the campus, or the WAN. And now one of our major efforts is to go across all of these and to provide an integrated intent-based networking architecture across. Okay. So now let me move on to artificial intelligence and say, why do we care about artificial intelligence here? And what is AI? The basic situation is that we, we as humans, we need help often. Um, if you think back to the Industrial Revolution where we got steam engines and cars and so forth, what happened is the steam engines liberated us as humans, from the limits of our physical capability. You know, our, our capability to move heavy things or to travel distances uh, uh, fast and so forth. So the Industrial Revolution helped us in many ways. Now we're at a, we're at a different stage. And for example, in terms of networks, our networks are often really, really big and very complicated. They can have thousands of network elements or tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of clients there. So the network's really complicated, the topology is complicated, things are changing all the time, there's a huge amount of data. No, no human can be able to understand what's happening uh, and, and react quickly enough. And that's why we need more help. So with the digital revolution that, that's occurring, we're trying to uh, leverage all these digital technologies to help us, liberate us from the limits of our mental capabilities. Okay? And the con in the context of networking, what we're doing here is trying to leverage the huge and diverse amount of data we get from, from the network, apply artificial, various forms of artificial intelligence to kind of summarize and see, hey, what is the really important piece of information we need to share with, uh, with the operators, with the humans, and then share it using rich visual human-computer interactions so the human can very quickly understand what's happening and decide what to do next. So once again, AI is to, is to try to help us uh, overcome um, and, uh, some of the huge amount of complexity that exists in networks so we can quickly understand what's happening and, uh, and figure out what to do next. Now let me briefly describe what artificial intelligence or AI is. And I describe this because many of you, I think, have a reasonably good understanding, but some of you may still be unsure. So just try to put together these, this simple description. So artificial intelligence is a field of study to make computers have human-like intelligence when performing a task. Now, usually this is for specific tasks. The task could be something like speech recognition, where the computer hears somebody speaking and translate that to text. It could be for playing a game like chess uh, or, or, or playing a, a computer game like, like for example, uh, Space Invaders. There are some recent advances in that, as many of you may know. So that's, that's essentially what AI is. Now, the three very important sub, the many subfields of AI, but the three that are especially important for us, and I've listed them here in green. The first is natural language processing, and you know, often referred to as NLP. And this gives the computers the ability to interact with humans via speech recognition and natural language understanding, and be able to understand what humans are talking about and what humans are trying to, are trying to do, okay? 
Second key area is machine learning, or ML. This gives computers the ability to learn from data without actually being programmed. Uh, for example, many of you are familiar that uh, recently deep learning has made major advances in identifying cats in videos. Okay? Well, how can you, it's really hard to program a computer to figure out what, what a cat looks like in a video. But machine learning is an automated way such that you give it tons of examples with, with cats labeled in the examples. Um, the computer can figure out itself how to be able to uh, identify cats in this case. In essence, what happens is with machine learning, the computer has the ability to identify patterns which is, which is very hard for a human to actually describe or which may be hard for a human to even notice. The third key area is machine reasoning. And this includes organizing domain-specific knowledge bases. By domain-specific, think about this as wireless or switching or routing or security. These are domain-specific uh, areas. And in each of these areas, organize different information about it, such as facts or relationship between the facts and, and rules and so forth. Uh, and manipulation of this knowledge to try to answer questions. Machine, re machine reason you can uh, think about as kind of like the evolution of expert systems from the 80s and 90s. Back then we had what was called expert systems, which we use knowledge from, from humans, from human experts, uh, to try to figure out various problems. Here, machine reason has had 20 years of additional uh, improvements, including semantic uh, understanding uh, um, um, and various sort of other CS developments, which make machine reason much more, much more practical today. And I'll describe some concrete examples of where we use each of these three types of AI uh, shortly. OK, so um, here's our picture of intent-based networking. Where does AI come into play here? It actually comes into play in all three of these conceptual building blocks, translation, activation, and assurance. For translation, it could come into play in terms of, this, in terms of recognizing the human speech and translate it to text, and then um, understanding what the text actually means, that is, what is a human trying to do. It comes into play in the activation as part of the optimization. Um, we have many paths, for instance, to selecting the internet. Which is the best path to select? Okay, and, and how can we do that efficiently? It also comes into play in assurance. For assurance, you want to identify, hey, is there a problem in the network? Turns out machine learning is very good for identifying problems. Uh, and it can detect a problem even before a human often would be able to detect that a problem is occurring. So, uh, so machine learning is very useful for assurance to detect problems. And once we detected a problem, we can use machine reasoning to identify what is the root cause of the problem and how we fix it. So AI comes into play in all three of these functional building blocks. And another thing I want to point out is that we have this feedback loop here. And this feedback loop is immensely powerful. Many of you may know from your, from your classes that feedback is incredibly powerful. Well, this feedback is something that we didn't have before. With SDN, you basically had automation to, uh, to the infrastructure, so it was more the feed for a path. But we didn't really have a low latency feedback path. The feedback is immensely powerful. And the AI and feedback um, complement each other and amplify uh, the benefits of each other. For example, let's say we have a problem. In the feedback path with assurance, we can identify what the problem and the root cause. We can then activate it in the network. And then we can check to see, is the network operating the way it should? If yes, great. If not, how can we, what, what other changes should we do to fix it? So that feedback loop really helps us uh, amplify the value of the work being done and helps us converge much quicker to our working network system. OK, let me now talk about uh, four examples of how AI and intent-based networking uh, can help provide significant improvements. I'll talk about intelligent automation, then intelligent assurance, then understanding what's on the network, and finally, how can we detect threats in encrypted traffic. So let's begin with intelligent automation. So let me, let me motivate this with a use case. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with augmented reality, and maybe many of you have used augmented reality to play games and so forth. Uh, 
Well, with augmented reality, what happens is you're seeing the natural world, but you are placing some additional information in top of that visual field. You're augmenting the real world with some additional information um, relevant to the task at hand. Um, this could be for education, this could be for playing games, this could be for understanding how a network works or how to do an operation, for instance. Um, well, one of the areas that people have wanted to do for a long time is interactive multi-user augmented reality. Now, by interactive multi-user augmented reality, what we mean is that the multiple people doing AR at the same time in an interactive manner, that is playing the same game or trying to design a project together or being involved in a, in a complicated uh, task together. And for, for these things to be successful, what you need is all of the individuals to see the exact same thing at the exact same time. Everything has to be synchronized on their displays, either the handhold display, AR displays, or their glasses or head-mounted displays. Well, my guess is that very few of you have ever done this before with the interactive multi-use AR, at least not for a challenge and task. And the reason that you haven't is because we can't synchronize these various AR systems. The reason we can't synchronize it is we can't get the wireless to work in, using prior technologies to, uh, to have them synchronized. Well, now with some advances uh, it, with Wi-Fi 6, as well as with AI for IBN, maybe we can solve this problem. So let me talk to you about what's happening with Wi-Fi 6. As many of you may be aware, Wi-Fi 6 is the newest Wi-Fi standard. Uh, it's officially known as 802.11ax. Um, what happens is because the, the prior standards were 11B, 11G, 11A, 11N, 11AC, 11AX, it's hard for people to keep track of this alphabet soup. So they decided, okay, we're just gonna have a simple numbering system. Wi-Fi one, two, three, four, five, six. It's easier to remember, right? So that's why 802.11ax is now called Wi-Fi 6. And by the way, this is available on iPhones and on Android phones already, and, and in shipping Cisco APs. Well, Wi-Fi 6 provides a number of benefits. Um, as you see here on the left-hand side, one of the things it provides is much higher data rates. Uh, for instance, it can use 1024 QAM, so it can get up to 9.6 gigabits per second um, for, for an 8 radio system. Now that's, that, that's in theory, and that's under, uh, and that's the phi layer, so, uh, so don't really give too much attention to that number of 9.6 gigabits. In practice, you have much less, but still, it's a really big number what we can achieve in practice. It will also increase your overall network capacity. Uh, we'll be able to support much higher throughput to mobile devices in the, in the network. That's what we show in the second column. In the third column, what happens is we'll be able to reduce the latency and provide greater reliability. This is because we're going to have scheduling now at the, at the AP, both for the downlink and the uplink. Uh, and this is very powerful. In addition, we'll have improved power efficiency. For example, the AP can tell the mobile device to turn off its radio uh, for a while, and then because it, uh, there's nothing to send to the mobile device, and then the, the, uh, the mobile device can save on battery life. Okay. Well, I want to talk about, well, as you can see, there are a variety of benefits from Wi-Fi 6. I want to talk about two of these, which correspond to the second and the, the third column here. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to talk about is how scheduling can allow us to provide much more deterministic services. And let's look at what is the latency and what is the aggregate throughput we can get in these cases. What you see on the left-hand side is a graph where I describe latency on the vertical axis and the number of users on the horizontal axis. Um, and something that many of you may be familiar with is that for Wi-Fi, uh, because historically it's used a technique called listen before talk or carry a sense mobile axis, what happened is that as the number of users uh, uh, for an AP increased, usually the latency also increased and can increase dramatically. And that's what you see by these red lines and these orange lines and so forth. And that's very bad because if you have applications that want low latency, um, uh, basically what this means is the application quality degrades as the number of users increase. Well, what happens with Wi-Fi 6, because we can use centralized scheduling, this, the AP can decide who to transmit to next. 
and it can ensure that it can deliver us all the packets uh, with low latency, and it can achieve these uh, light blue uh, uh, line at the very bottom. So it can achieve much lower latency than prior versions of, of Wi-Fi. This is really good, especially for interactive applications. Now let's look at aggregate throughput on the right-hand side. The aggregate throughput is the total bitrate delivered to all the to all the clients around a single AP. Okay. So you may also be familiar that as the number of users increase to a given AP, because of this listen before talk approach, the variety of inefficiencies there, and the, the aggregate throughput can fall significantly as the number of users increase. You know, that is as you go from 10 users to 20 to 30 to 50, the total throughput you're delivering can fall, which is very bad. On the other hand, by having this deterministic scheduling, um, we can ensure that the aggregate throughput stays high even as the number of users uh, increases. That's what you see with this light blue curve at the top. As we increase from 10 to 20 to 40 users, the aggregate bit rate delivered to all of the users for that single AP uh, uh, stays constant. So what happens here, as you can see, is with this deterministic scheduling at the AP, we can dramatically reduce latency and keep consistent uh, throughput. Uh, this allows uh, Wi-Fi 6 to also deliver service level agreements on, on latency and on, and on throughput. And this was something that was not possible before. Here's another uh, advantage of Wi-Fi 6. Um, on the left, I show uh, prior versions of Wi-Fi, which use a technology called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM. Okay, and basically what happens there is that at each time up, at each time transmission opportunity, as you see in the bottom, um, uh, um, the prior versions of Wi-Fi would use all the spectrum to transmit to a single user. Let's say to the the first time slot to the blue user, the second time slot to the dark green, and the third time slot to the light green. Okay. Well, as you can see here, there's actually a lot of wasted spectrum because you didn't need to use all those frequencies to transmit maybe a little packet to the, to the dark green user there. So the improvement that Wi-Fi 6 has is something called orthogonal frequency division multiple access. There's an A at the end, and I colored it green here on the right-hand side. And what this basically means is that at each transmission opportunity, the AP can transmit to multiple clients at the same time. So now in this case, at the first transmission opportunity, the AP can transmit to the light green and the light blue clients at the same time. At the second transmission opportunity, it can transmit to five clients at the same time, and so forth. So in this way, with OFDMA, it can do a much better job at packing all of the transmissions in and to deliver to more clients in each time slot. Another way to view this off also is that the latency is now reduced because you can transmit to more clients sooner. Okay. So this is a very valuable uh, technique. Now, what I showed you before with a, with a scheduling is very valuable. What I showed you here, which is another form of scheduling with OFDMA, is also really valuable. So these APs now have tools to do really complicated things. But the question is how to, in real time, figure out what to do. You have these tools, but uh, how do you figure out for all the uh, devices that are talking to a given AP with the different applications that are running, with the different packets in, in each of the queues and stuff, what is the right packet to transmit next? Turns out that's a complicated problem, and it's actually a combinatorial problem. And solving it in an AP, which, is, uh, which you want to build at low cost, is, is challenging. The good news is a lot of these techniques from AI, especially from machine learning and related techniques, can be used to dramatically help uh, uh, improve the optimization for all these scheduling problems I mentioned. So they can help do the, the intelligent automation for Wi-Fi 6 and can help us potentially turn interactive multi-use AR into reality. Okay. Now let me uh, talk about the second area, intelligent assurance. So the goal of assurance is to make sure that the network's operate in the way it should, that is, providing really good performance. Now, as many of you know, um, when there's a problem, it's often really hard to identify where the problem is. Uh, and let me just illustrate why that's the case with this simple diagram here. Well, what you have here are, for instance, some clients all the way on the left-hand side 
who want to talk with an application on a server on the right-hand side. And these clients need to go over the Wi-Fi network, then through the access point over the campus network, maybe to the local wireless controller, then over the WAN to the data center, through the data center network, and so forth, then to the server. So there are quite a few different steps it has to go through. And actually, there are quite a few places that a problem can occur. So when, when, when a problem does occur, figuring out where that problem actually was caused can be quite challenging. What we want to do with assurance is we want to figure out, is there a problem? If there is, what is the problem? Where is the problem? And of course, how can I quickly fix the problem? Okay? These are very natural questions, right? These are the natural things you do whenever you're faced with a problem. Um, and I describe it like this because these are the type of things we want to address uh, in an automated way with assurance. Okay, um, I'll talk about these next. Um, <clears throat> but one thing that happens is sometimes people may think, oh, it's easy to know when a problem occurs. Um, and I, that may or may not be the case. Uh, for example, let's say it takes 200 milliseconds for me to get onboarded on the Wi-Fi network. Is that good or is that bad? How do you know if that's a problem? It's hard to tell. Um, for certain problems, you find out because you get a trouble ticket or somebody's called up to complain. Well, I would argue in those cases, um, a problem occurred, but it already has negatively impacted the productivity of somebody. Um, and rather than us finding out by them calling us and complaining, it would be much better if we had proactively identified that there was a problem and proactively figured out how to solve it to solve it before they would have complained. That is, that's the ideal situation. That's what we'd like to go to. Okay, let's look at how we can automatically detect if there's a problem or not. And let me begin by describing the conventional way to detect a problem. The conventional way to detect a problem is to look at various attributes of the system, you know, uh, like the onboarding time for, for a client to a wireless AP, and to kind of figure out what is the normal range of operation. For example, there may be a parameter there, onboarding time, and there may be a min and a max. And as long as the, the operations within those, between the min and the max, everything is good. And if it's outside, you say, oh, oh, maybe a problem occurs. Okay? This is, this is trying to estimate the baseline or the normal operation of the network, such that if the network operates outside its baseline, then we identify a problem. <clears throat> well, this approach has challenges. In this example where I gave with these uh, min and the max thresholds, um, how do you know how to choose those? And how do those vary as things in the network vary, or as, for instance, the number of people on the wireless network change? It actually would be natural for the onboarding time to change if there, if there are 10 people on the network or if there are 500 people on the network, right? <clears throat> so choosing the, the thresholds is one issue. Another issue is that every time we raise an alert, uh, that gets somebody's attention. Um, and if we raise uh, too many alerts, and these alerts are false positives, that is that there's an alert, but it's actually not a problem, then whoever receives the alerts gets very frustrated. And if they get too many of these false positives, they stop paying attention. And then this whole system becomes useless. So false, a lot of false positives are really bad. We want to identify when there's a problem, but we don't want to have these false positives, these false alerts. So one of the things that we've invested quite a bit on with AI here is to do what we call more dynamic or customized baselines, where we do a much more sophisticated uh, approach using machine learning to identify, hey, is the network operating the way it should or is there an anomaly? Uh, as a result of this, we get much more relevant anomalies and many fewer false positives, okay? I show it here with this simple example. Let me give you some concrete numbers from a, from a customer study. Here's a customer study with 11 customers uh, uh, over a three month period. And for these 11 customers, they had about 8,000 alerts during that three month period where these alerts were found using common statistical models. Okay, that's the big um, a yellow orange circle over here. Now using some context of our baseline, we're able to reduce it from 8,000 to 1192. And then using some more sophisticated techniques, the AI-driven baselining, we reduced it to 303. 
Um, by the way, these are all wireless issues, and we can further segment these wireless issues, and seven of them were onboarding issues, as you see on the bottom middle here. And 296 were, well, all onboarding issues are bad, because if there's a problem getting on the network, then, then that's really bad. 296 of them were throughput issues, and some of those throughput issues are really important, and some are not as important. So we also use the AI to prioritize which are the important throughput issues, and we had 85 of those there. So then as a result of all this work, when we started out with 8,000 uh, alerts, we brought it down to 85 plus 7 or 92 prioritizer alerts. So it's a 98% reduction in the number of alerts which were shown to the network operator. As you can guess, they were thrilled by this because there are many fewer false positives and the alerts they saw were really relevant to what to um, help and improve the operation for customers. Okay. So how does Cisco Assurance work? First of all, we gather together data from throughout the network, all kinds of rich data, uh, rich classes of data, as you see here on the left-hand side. We then do complex event processing and across this data, correlations and so forth. And then we try to identify insights. Insights from the client's perspective, from the application perspective, from the network's perspective. See which of those are the most important. Um, if we, we try to detect if there are problems, if there is a problem, we then try to identify root cause, and then how can we fix the problem? So we can guide the user to remediate it. Uh, I'm not going into detail about this here. We have a, a lot of material online for those who are interested. The key thing I want to stress to you, though, is that assurance is a very new capability. And there are huge opportunities here to apply machine, machine learning to identify problems, and then machine reasoning to help diagnose what is the cause of that problem. Um, and this can lead to dramatic improvements for our, for our customers. Let me give you an example of this from a, from a university that's pretty close to us here in, in San Jose, California. They had a Wi-Fi onboarding issue. And by Wi-Fi onboarding, we mean the people with a mobile device getting on the university's Wi-Fi network. The problem they had was that some of the students were sometimes having a problem getting on the network. And as you can guess, some of the students sometimes, that's a really annoying situation because that's hard to debug. Um, fortunately, they were having some of our wireless assurance uh, um, technology, and they turned it on, and they gathered and analyzed the data. And within five minutes, they were able to detect that there was only a specific set of users of students that ever had a problem. They only had a problem they connected to a specific set of APs. Turns out that subset of APs were connected to a specific wireless controller, which was updated the night before in terms of software. The software update was fine. The certificate on the, the wireless controller was fine. But the certificate on some of the clients were out of date versus the server, and that caused the problem. Okay. Well, why did I show you all these different steps? I mentioned all these different steps because a networking expert like you or me could take hours or days or sometimes even weeks figuring this out because it's often complicated going from the observed problem trying to figure out what the root cause is. In this case, because the system was able to automatically gather all the data and perform a huge number of automatic checks and use machine learning type techniques to um, to find the patterns and so forth, they were able to identify the issue within five minutes. So this is an example of some of the huge benefits that wireless assurance can provide uh, to help speed up troubleshooting and so forth. Some of these capabilities are connected as part of, uh, are now available as part of DNA AI network analytics. This was announced at Cisco Live last June. For example, uh, the personalized baselining was included here. Uh, intelligent uh, uh, analysis to get insights about what's happening in the network, and then uh, root cause analysis uh, followed by accelerated remediation. That is, fixing the problems that, that were caused. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the next section, understanding what's on the network. <clears throat> what's on the network is a pretty fundamental problem, uh, but at first sometimes we don't realize how important it is. And by what's on the network, I mean what devices on the network, what applications, what users, and so forth. The reason this is important, because once you know what's on the network, then you can decide how you want to treat it. You, uh, for example, you can take some applications that need low latency and put them on a low latency path. Um, you can take other uh, applications that need high bandwidth, put them on a high bandwidth path, so forth. 
It's also really important for security. So for example, maybe you have HR databases. You probably only want the HR uh, people to access those databases, and you don't want anybody else to access those databases. Um, similarly, the certain devices that you may only want certain people to access. Um, so knowing what's on the network really helps that. As an example from a security perspective, um, some of you may have heard of the NotPetya virus. This was a virus that started out in the Ukraine, but, but affected companies throughout the world. And this was one of the most destructive uh, uh, viruses. Um, and according to the US Department of Homeland Security, it caused about $10 billion of damage. Um, there's a very interesting article in Wired um, in August 22nd, 2018, that describes what happened here. But to summarize it, what happened is that the malware was able, once, once it got a single computer in a company, it was able to spread very easily laterally across the company. And that's what caused all the trouble. Even the article describes that network segmentation would have been able to dramatically reduce the problem. But to do network segmentation, you do need to know what's on the network. Once you know what's on the network, then you could do the segmentation very easily. This is a, a nice example of some work done about three years ago, actually, by an academic, by an academic group. Cisco uh, uh, co-sponsored this effort. And I like this because it really shows an example of how you can identify the different devices on the network. The various columns here correspond to different IoT devices. For example, Amazon Echoes, Dropcam cameras, uh, uh, various uh, uh, healthcare monitors, connected light bulbs, and so forth. The various rows correspond to different attributes of the network. And what the authors here have done, they've, they have um, uh, classified the attributes intensity on a scale from one to five and color coded it from purple to blue to orange to green and red. And the reason I love this is if you look at each column, you see a color pattern. And that color pattern basically describes the fingerprint of that device. Now what's nice is as you look across all of these different col uh, columns, you can very easily see their color fingerprints are different. And that's what allows us to identify these devices. This is an example of applying machine learning to identify the different devices on the network. So, uh, <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit more about how machine learning is used here. First, what we want to do is we want to identify what devices and apps are on the network. Once we know the devices, we want to use intent-based networking to separate them into different network segments, into different virtual networks. Then apply best practices to optimize the performance of each device, each application. And then also perform behavioral analytics to ensure they're behaving the way that was expected. For example, there could be an anomaly, which may mean the device is malfunctioning, or could have been a compromise and a security attacks going to occur. And I want to point out here that points one, three, and four, all of these are done uh, with machine learning. So as you can see, machine learning helps a lot uh, in significant ways to accomplish what I just described. Let me go quickly now to the fourth example of identifying malware in encrypted traffic. In the prior example, I, I talked about identifying devices on the network, and I also mentioned the importance of security. Well, we want to identify if there's malware going in the traffic on the network, because if there's malware, we want to stop it. Okay? The conventional way of doing it is the following. If we've seen some malware before, we, make a, a, we find a fingerprint of that malware, and we store it in a database. And then if the, if the traffic is unencrypted, what we do is we have a box in the middle of the network, as you see here shown in orange. And as all the traffic goes through the box, we look at each packet to see if we see that fingerprint. If we see that fingerprint, we stop it. If we don't see that fingerprint, we let it go. So this is a simple way of identifying malware in unencrypted traffic. Now, as you know, the world's going to an encrypted traffic with end-to-end -end encryption. That's really good. It's really good for you. I hope you use end-to-end uh, -end encryption. It's good for your security. It's good for your privacy, so forth. The problem is the bad guys can also use encrypted traffic to hide the malware. And the question is, how do, how do we identify malware in encrypted traffic? Um, the way that it's conventionally done here is that, once again, you have the box in the middle of the network, and you give it the keys to actually take the encrypted traffic and then first de-encrypt it then look for the fingerprints on the unencrypted traffic, and then re-encrypt it at the other end. Okay? That's what's currently done today. Um, this is very bad. 
It's very bad because they decrypt the traffic, so it breaks your privacy. Um, um, also, you're sending around the keys, which can lead to security issues. The confidence in plain text in the middle, so it can be attacked. And it's also very computationally intensive. So this is really bad. We'd, we'd prefer not to do this. So that motivated us about five, six years ago to examine the problem of can we identify malware in encrypted traffic without requiring decryption? Okay, that is, can we identify malware in encrypted traffic without decrypting the data? That's why you see here I have a key at the bottom with a, with a, with a red line through it. So no keys, no decryption. Turns out with, this, with a careful use of machine learning, we can solve this problem and we can do it in a really elegant way. Um, some of my colleagues, Dave McGrew and Blake Anderson, have written some, uh, have developed this and they've written some really nice papers on it. It's also available as a Cisco product called Encrypted Threat Analytics. For those interested, I highly recommend to, to read up on it about online because it's a very, very uh, fascinating example of the use of machine learning to improve security. So let me mention that uh, uh, in finishing here, that's a very exciting time in networking. Uh, Intent-based networking can dramatically improve the performance, the agility, security, and reliability. And I showed how AI plus IBM can enable us to do really fascinating things. It can help do automation much better than before and assurance and helping you know what's on the network as well as detecting threats. For those of you who want to learn more information, there are a variety of sources uh, available on the, on the web. I'm not including the links here because the links are really long, but I included some information so that essentially if you do a search with your favorite search engine, such as Google, you'd be able to find it. For example, there's a white paper on IBM, um, and you, if you just search for Cisco IBM PDF, you'll be able to find it. I have some blogs directly on these topics of AI for IBM. There's an intent-based networking website that has a huge amount of information. We also have an AI for networking primer. Uh, and we also have a 2020 Global Network and Trends Report, uh, which has a huge amount of information about network and trends and uh, um, uh, uh, use cases and, and so forth. And as mentioned, the Network Academy has a variety of additional sources, uh, new CCNA uh, things on intent-based networking and on AI, which are incredibly valuable. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John, for that fabulous presentation. I, I, the ability to determine threats and encrypted traffic, I just, I can't wrap my head around that. That's fascinating <laughs> to me, so thank you for sharing that. Um, we will take some questions now. We got a few questions in, John, so I'd like to share them with you. One of the questions is, how are software-defined networking and intent-based networking related? How do those two things work together? Okay, great. Maybe I'll go back to one of the slides here. Um, so I've gone back to my slide that shows the conceptual view of intent-based networking. And you can see that the three conceptual building blocks there are translation, activation, and assurance. Well, SDN is really part of activation, and it's the bottom half part. It's the automation part. So a human or spe somebody specifies what, the, uh, uh, what you're trying to accomplish, and then it's automated in the network. So it's just that feed-forward part from that blue part from the blue activation going downward to the physical and virtual infrastructure. A key part of intent-based networking is we have this feedback loop, which includes the assurance. So we're looking at what's happening in the network, we're, we're monitoring, we provide visibility, we try to detect that there are problems, and if there's a problem, we try to figure out how to solve it. So the assurance is completely new, the translation is new, and the optimization part of activation is also a new, a new thing. So you can view the relationship between SDN and IBN as SDN was originally focused on various forms of centralized automation. And IBN is, after decades more work, we've taken that and extended it to have this, this system with the feedback that also does assurance, translation, and various forms of optimization. Oh, that was a good answer. Thanks, John. I think that cleared it up. Um, another one that I think is pretty interesting is you hear a lot about zero trust. So mm. how does zero trust security fit into this intent-based networking model? What's the intersection point of those two? Oh, excellent question. Excellent question. So one of the things with zero trust is you want to verify first before giving access. Okay. 
This is true for zero trust for the workforce like us with our mobile devices and so forth, devices on network. This is true for zero trust for the workplace. And it's also true for zero trust for workloads. In all these cases, we want to verify first and then provide access. Well, what intent-based networking does is provides a lot of eyes and ears to really understand what's happening and help with the verification. And then if a problem's identified, it's able to very quickly react to that and, and remediate it. For example, uh, maybe some malware gets on my device. It wasn't there initially, but it comes on the device. Once the network realizes that, it can quarantine my device so, I, so the malware cannot spread to affect other uh, devices on the network. Ah, that's good. So all the techniques that you've mentioned are really sort of a little army out there for us, kind of helping build up the zero trust model, kind of, you know, little robots in a way out there. Um, so here's a, a good question, I think, which is, do you, we've talked about AIML. Do you have to be an expert at AIML to apply them successfully to intent-based networking? Do I have to go off and get a PhD in AIML to be able to actually implement intent-based networking? Oh, that's an awesome question. That's great. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, short answer is no. Um, what you need to be expert in is whatever that primary domain you're working in. For example, it could be networking or wireless or computing or, or routing or switching. You want to be an expert in that. And what happens is what, all, what we're doing with the AI is we're trying to make your job easier. So instead of you having to go out and pull information from all these possible data sources throughout the network and then look through it yourself via whatever is your favorite uh, uh, word process or other way to, to examine the log files and everything else and then identify what the problem is and go across. All those steps, we're trying to do that automatically for you and then be able to provide you information saying, hey, we think this is a problem. This is the data we've seen that suggests that this is the problem. Based on that, we believe this is a possible root causes. And for each of these root causes, these are some candidate solutions. Now, you, based on your network expertise, your domain expertise, you can look at this and say, hey, does that make sense? If it does make sense, yeah, based on that data, I do think that that's the right problem. And yeah, um, that's the right way to solve it. Then you can press go to activate that, and then it'll be activated in the network. But so what you need is to have expertise in your domain so that if we provide you all the data in a summarized form, you can look at it, you can see if it makes sense, and you can choose what is the right course of action to do next. Because oftentimes there may be multiple candidate solutions, especially in the complicated cases of multiple candidate solutions, and your expertise will be key to figuring out which is the right one to do. To do. Okay, well, John, we've got a lot more questions. You really stimulated a lot of interest out there, but I think we only have time for one more. So this is a tough one. So here we go. How do you see, um, or let me go back up to this one. Where does the AI itself sit or where is it located on the network? How is it that it cannot be hacked or manipulated to infiltrate the same network that is helping us to monitor? That's an awesome question. Thank you for <laughs> asking that also. Um, two things here. First of all, this is, like the this is like the top priority, right? Because whenever you have a controller managed infrastructure like we have, the attackers are going to try to go after the controller and go after other key elements to try to take over. So one of the main things we focus on is ensure and security of that. As you know, Cisco, as you may know, Cisco is the leader in terms of building trustworthy network systems where we build in extra chips. Um, we design our own ASICs, include extra capabilities there to prove the trustworthiness of the hardware, then of the firmware, then of the OS, then of the application running on top. So we have this root of trust and this chain here, which we use to ensure the integrity of these devices. So um, there's a lot of work done in this space. Um, I highly encourage you to look at trustworthy systems and look at some of the other efforts that Cisco does to ensure that people cannot hack this. Because as you mentioned, if somebody can hack it, that can be incredibly bad. If they can, they will. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate you taking time out of your, your schedule to talk us through this IBN and, and answering these questions. So thanks so much for your time. 
And for all of you out there, I, I think this has opened your eyes, I hope, to how exciting and all the changes that are occurring in networking today, right? It's, it's really an amazing time. Um, and so we're going to show you that QR code again. We'd love to, you to complete the survey. We'd also like you to investigate some of our courses that John mentioned. And we're not stopping with education, folks. On the next series here, we're going to have a virtual career fair because at Netacad, we believe it's important not only to train the next generation of, of IT and network technology folks, but also help you move into the career field. Because as we know, there are a lot of openings out there and we need well-trained people. So thanks so much for joining us today. Check out this QR code, check out Netacad, check out the resources that John linked, uh, showed the links to, because there's a lot to learn out there. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care everybody and be well. Bye now. Okay, so here we go. I want to talk about real news. So let's talk about what we're going to launch today. Here we go! All of you have made some pretty amazing things possible over the years. We got WebEx, we got TP.